Welcome to the Five in the News. As the world is gripped with violence in Baltimore and the earthquake in Nepal, the political seas and waves are also roaring throughout Europe. Headlines this week have highlighted the dependence of Europe on Russia. The New York Times ran an article this week with the headline, What Central Europe Really Thinks About Russia, in which it stated, It was only a decade ago that Central Europe and the American imagination was Donald Rumsfeld's New Europe, a collection of freedom-loving, heroic, small nations and America's most loyal allies. Washington ushered them into NATO as a bulwark against Middle Eastern instability and Russian expansionism. Today, however, that perception has changed. Many fear that a number of these plucky, strategically vital states have become Moscow's Trojan, Trojan horses in the Western alliances. End quote. The author cites as proof for his assertion the Czech President Milo Zeman intention to attend the military parade in Moscow marking the 70th anniversary of the Soviet victory over Nazi Germany until pressure forced him to withdraw. It also cited Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban intention to block the proposed European Energy Union designed to stop Russia's influence in Europe. And thirdly, the survey indicated the majority of Poles oppose weapons delivery to Ukraine and even larger majority are reluctant to let Ukrainians travel freely in the European Union. So regardless of all its rhetoric, the European Union is going to struggle with isolating Russia. Some of its member states are too tightly tied to Russia, while others are getting closer all the time. Greece is moving closer to being under the grip of Putin's Russia. Reuters reported the following under the headline, Greek-Russia ties bloom as default looms. The article stated, Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras and Gazprom CEO Alexei Miller agreed last week on a roadmap for a multi-billion dollar pipeline project to transport gas from Russia to Greece. The long-term plan is a further sign of warming geopolitical ties between Athens and Moscow, at a moment when the Greek economic crisis appears to be worsening. The article went on to state, Defense Minister, Minister Panos Kaminos has floated the idea in public of receiving wider Russian aid, and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has indicated that Moscow would consider such a request were it made. End quote. Well, the idea of Europe pulling away from Russia has been explored by Forbes magazine, which stated the following. Can the EU ever truly kick its main foreign gas supplier to the curb? Here's the quick answer. Nyet. Russian for no. Russian natural gas accounts for roughly a third of all foreign supplied natural gas coming into Europe. Russia's biggest partner is Germany. In that state, Russian presence is on the upswing. Gazprom Germania, a subsidiary of the Russian state-owned gas giant and German utility ENBW, signed an agreement on the 24th of April to acquire four ENBW natural gas filling stations in the cities of Stuttgart and Nagold. The deal is supposed to be official on Friday. That acquisition gives Gazprom Germania 28 natural gas filling stations in green-loving Germany. Gazprom plans to be running 35 stations by the end of this year, end quote. So Germany isn't going to divorce its energy daddy anytime soon. Forbes went on to explain just how dependent Europe is on Russian energy. It stated, in 2013, Germany accounted for 40% of Gazprom's exports to the EU. Turkey came in second at 26.9%, and Turkey has signed a deal with Russian government recently to build a pipeline into Europe, with which, or which will be an alternative to the three pipelines that currently bring Russian gas to the EU via Ukraine. In third place is Italy, accounting for 25.3% of Russia's gas exports to Europe, according to the company. End quote. But what about the Ukraine? With all this crisis in the Crimea and the ongoing for battle for Ukraine, isn't Europe squarely behind Ukraine and backing Russia down? Well, not exactly. Stratford Global Intelligence Service reported the following. In late February, an entire battalion-sized mechanized infantry unit arrived in Belgorod, while armor and artillery units moved towards the city by rail. 
Convoys carrying armored personnel carriers, supply trucks, and command vehicles followed later. By mid-March, there was at least two mechanized battalions, one artillery battalion, and one air defense battalion, and at least two armored companies in Bel Belgorod. The Russian city is located about 40 kilometers away from the border with Ukraine, close to the strategic Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. Deploying so close to Kharkiv is a threat to the Ukrainian government. Despite the ceasefire, Russia has never stopped moving weapons and equipment to Sepharis across the border, most notably transferring tanks on a regular basis. While separatist forces could use these resources for offensive purposes, the Kremlin training and weapons programs for separatists is likely designed both to entrench Russian influence in the separatist territories and boost its leverage against Ukraine and the West. End quote. Well, the Economist commented on the lack of resolve from the EU in making any real commitment to the Ukraine when it comes to Russia. It stated, the romance between Ukraine and the European Union is full of unmet expectations. Ukraine wants commitment from the EU, and the EU wants proof that Ukraine has really changed. When EU officials visited Kiev on the 27th for a joint summit, they snubbed Ukraine's request for a peacekeeping force in Donbass, for additional military aid, and for visa fee travel. Greece, Greece already, already received, received 300, 300 billion dollars, dollars with, no, with war, no war, no Russian, no Russian tanks, tanks, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian Prime, Prime Minister, Minister said after, after the summit. Ukraine, he complained, has received just one-tenth as much, end quote. The article cites Ukraine's corruption as the reason for Europe's resistance to commitment. However, dealing with corruption is unlikely, as the Prime Minister is an oligarch himself. So Russia keeps on pushing ahead. Well, what can Europe do? The Wall Street Journal ran the headline, Putin marches, Europe sues, and described how Europe is hiding behind lawsuits instead of doing anything concrete, and stated, the European Commission filed an antitrust suit against Gazprom for dominating its energy market. In lieu of more energy production, file a lawsuit. Yeah, that'll work, end quote. Well, the article went on to lament how Europe's own energy supply cannot be tapped due to the Green parties who will not allow any development on Euro the European continent. So while Europe is vacillating, Russia is building its forces up. National Interest reported on April 29, 2015, Russia has launched what it claims to be the quietest submarine in the world. This week, Admiralty Shipyards, a Russian defense company, held a ceremonial launching for its newest Varshavyanka-class diesel-electric submarines. Russia state media outlets have said that the Varshavyanka-class are the quietest in the world, and so was dubbed the Black Hole by NATO. The submarine packs a powerful punch and are intended primarily for anti-shipping and anti-submarine warfare armed with 18 torpedoes and eight surface-to-air club missiles. They are intended for anti-shipping and anti-submarine missions in relatively shallow waters. They have an extended combat range and can strike surface, underwater, and land targets, Russia Today previously reported. The torpedoes are launched out of six bays, which automatically reload every 15 seconds." End quote. Well, this new launch is in keeping with the preparation that is described in Ezekiel 38, verse 7, and the form of attack described in Daniel 11, verse 40, where it states at the coming invasion, the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. These machines are not just for show either. The increase in aggressive activity is being seen around the world. This week, under the headline, Russia Conducts Nuclear Bomber Flights Near Alaska, the Washington Beacon reported two Russian Bear H bombers intruded into the Alaskan Air Defense Zone. Isn't the Russian Navy all washed up, though? How capable is the new Russian Air Force? Well, the article stated, Northern Command Commander Admiral William Gortney told reporters that Russia is developing a far more capable mil military than its predecessor, the Soviet Union, which made up for its poor quality of troops and equipment by deploying a very large number of forces, he said. 
Moscow has published a new military doctrine that explains the military annexation of Ukraine's Crimea and covert backing of armed rebels in the eastern Ukraine, Gortney said. Both number of flights and number of locations for the bomber flights have gone up, he said. But really, my question is, what is their intent long-term-wise? General Philip Breedlove, commander of the U.S. European Command, told the Senate hearing Thursday that a revanchist Russian threat under Vladimir Putin is the most serious security worry facing the region. Russia is blatantly challenging the rules and principles that have been the bedrock of European security for decades, Breedlove told the Senate Armed Service Committee. This is global. It's not regional. And it's enduring, not temporary, he said. Russian aggression is clearly visible. It is a legal occupation of Crimea and its continued operation in the eastern Ukraine. What worries me is Russia, as a nation now adopting an approach that says that it can and will use military power to change international borders, Breedlove said. That's what I truly worry about every day. End quote. Well, on the heels of this, Tuesday's headline in the Washington Times read, Finland fires unsuspected Russian submarine in waters off Helsinki. The article stated, six months after a Russian sub lurking off the coast of Stockholm triggered Sweden's biggest national or naval mobilization since the Cold War, officials in Finland said Tuesday that the country's military had fired underwater depth charges at a suspicious vessel in waters near Helsinki. The, or the development comes amid months of claims by Western and Eastern European military officials that Russian fighter jets and naval vessels have increased the frequency of their surprise incursions into the airspace and waters of other nations. Moscow is, in turn, had complained about what it says are Western provocations along its borders, including expanded military supplies to Ukraine and joint military exercises with countries all along the border with Russia in recent months. While Bible prophecy makes it clear that Russia and Europe will be confederate in the attack on Israel in the time of the end. We read in Ezekiel 38, verse 2 and 6, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, as the RSV has, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Goes on to say in verse 6, it's going to include Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarmer, of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Well, Rosh corresponds to Russia, Meshach to Moscow, and Tubal to the Tobolsk regions. Historians identify Magog with the area of Eastern Europe and the area that used to be called the Warsaw Pact, located between the rivers Don and Danube. The bands of Gomer migrated across Europe and settled in Germany and France, corresponding to the Germanic and Gallic peoples. These nations come together against Israel, and Gog's control over them is indicated in verse 7, where we read, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company, that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Well, being a guard, Hebrew mishmar, indicates a place of confinement, prison, jail, guard post, or to hold in custody. So the prince of Russia has to hold Europe in confinement or custody. Well, with the media increasingly speaking about Russia's hegemony over the Eastern European nation once again, and the military excursions all around the rest of Europe, we see the Bible in the news as the world draws closer to the great day of God Almighty. And as we watch the Bible in the news, it should provoke us to evaluate our daily lives, as Paul challenges us in the epistle to the Romans. Knowing the time, it is now high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 13, verses 11 to 14. So let us not get overcharged with the cares of this life and pulled away to the world at the twelfth hour. Let us prepare ourselves to meet our Lord, because he will soon be here as a thief in the night to the nations, but to the people of God, they should be prepared to meet him with joy.
For the Bible in the News, this has been Jonathan Bowen joining you.